and we are rushing ahead uh, with our second uh, presentation on uh, open science in qualitative social research, which we were particularly keen to, to cover uh, and bring into um, our conference here in Mannheim. Uh, our next presenter will be um, Sebastian Kacher uh, for a swift talk, so uh, sort of the opposite of what you've just experienced, <laughs> on an innovative um, way and application to uh, make qualitative research practices uh, more transparent. And we'll, he'll tell us what that application is, how it works, and to what effect um, right now. Welcome, Sebastian. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I studied political science in Germany a very long time ago. And at least when I studied, uh, Mannheim was always, um, and at that point in German political science, that was really weird. They did everything with numbers. Uh, and uh, so I feel like I'm in the lion's den for this, and this is very exciting. So annotation for transparent inquiry, and this is a very straightforward question. How do we make qualitative research transparent or more transparent? For quantitative research, we have a pretty good model. Quantitative research, and I'm simplifying here, I realize this, but our basic model is this. We have our data in rows and columns uh, in a matrix. Uh, we have some code uh, that we use to analyze the data. Uh, we use those two things to produce a figure or a table in our publication. Uh, we put the code and uh, the data in a data repository and voila, open science, everyone happy. I realize it's not fully open science, but it's good transparent research. It works pretty well. It's not, however, how qualitative research works. A lot of qualitative research uh, proceeds more along this way. I have a couple of claims that I make in a sentence, in a paragraph, an empirical claim, an analytical claim, maybe even a causal claim. I base this on one, two, three sources that I analyze, sometimes implicitly, sometimes uh, explicit, uh, explicitly, and I do this repeatedly throughout an article, I would say often 25, 30, 50 times within a single article. So my model of how do I make this transparent, my traditional model, uh, doesn't really work. Um, there's actually, and this being Germany, um, kind of we invented the original way of thinking about the analytic transparency about this, right? This is Leopold von Ranke. We write a statement and then we write a footnote that's about four times as long as the statement that we uh, write. Um, and uh, that's hardly done anymore for all sorts of reasons. It's terrible to read. It's clumsy. Um, in this case, it's actually an endnote, so it's even more clumsy and more terrible to read. Um, uh, but it actually did produce a lot of transparency in terms of analytic methods and also in terms of where does the data uh, come from. But it's infeasible for lots of ways and it still does not get us to the data. So that's kind of where we're coming from and where we're thinking about, okay, what can we do? Can, how can we bring the footnote into the 21st century plus add data, qualitative data to this? Uh, and that's what annotation for transparent inquiry is. Uh, so this is... Uh, a live view of an article that's up on uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, I want to say it's in the British Journal of Political Science. Um, so you have the article PDF on the left, also works on the HTML. Uh, and then you have an empirical statement uh, by the author. It's highlighted in yellow, it's annotated. And then when you click the annotation, on the right, that whole annotation uh, comes up. Um, you have the analytic note, which is our extended footnote, can be as long as you want because it's usually hidden, doesn't impede your reading workflow. You have the excerpt from the original source that that statement uh, really is based on, and then you see the link there to the data source. You click that, you get taken to the qualitative data repository, and then uh, you can see the entirety of that source to the extent that that's possible given copyright, human subjects, on sense, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the repository side, we also have, you know, all the good things that come with data, uh, extensive metadata and documentation, right? How was, were the sources selected, all those sorts of things, and you can get to all those sources at the same time. We also just now, uh, we archive the annotations themselves in addition to the server from which they're served. We archive them uh, at the data repository and, replay, uh, and display a view where you see all of those annotations. So how does this look in practice? Um, 
All of the examples that I have are live, and they have a little short link, so if you want to follow along live, uh, you can do so. The most typical application, and I uh, referenced historical research before, is the historical document, right? You make a s statement. Uh, this one is, uh, is about um, the history of, of foreign policy in relation to the Bangladesh uh, independence. Uh, so, so, so they want to establish foreign policy uh, positions, right? There is the analytic node, right? What, what is this? Why am I basing this? My claim, there is the excerpt. Then you follow the link and you get to the document. The document is at the British National Archives, right? So if you think about you want to reproduce, you want to follow along with this as a reader, you travel to London, you get permissions, you get the box of documents. This is an arduous process. It's really cool that you can do that uh, just with one click. And that's perhaps the most quintessential application of that. And it's really fantastic. Um, as we went further into this, we actually found further things. So this is from an article in Security Studies, which is a journal that's read widely by um, policymakers uh, and by foreign policy specialists. And two researchers, a political scientist and a historian, uh, were insisting that in order to uh, understand Iranian foreign policy views, especially with relation to the uh, nuclear deal, you need to understand the histor historiography and how Iranians talk about their foreign policy. So they used a ton of foreign language sources that they translated. And what we were able to do is, we were able to show that uh, source excerpt in the original Farsi they were able to provide an extensive translation of that. In that case, we couldn't share the full resource because of copyright concerns, but you get a very good sense, and you have this dialogue where the area expertise, uh, experts can look at the Farsi, uh, but the kind of generalists uh, can look the, at the extended uh, translation, and then you have that sort uh, of um, transparency. And for us, perhaps the most, um, the most unexpected uh, benefit came from sociolinguists, so that's people who study how other people talk and they have a particular dilemma because uh, you, s uh, you study something and then you write it down, but what you're actually interested in is how people talk and so they come up with these complicated ways, ways to transcribe things and phonetical language, but it never gets you quite there. So what they were able to do, uh, they were actually uh, able to annotate statements in their text with a link to the sound file because they're linguists, these are not sensitive data, right? They just have conversations with people to talk naturally. And so they were able to link to the sound clips on our repository that actually showed how uh, and I really encourage you to look at this because the sound clips are from a Scottish fisher village and it's the coolest thing ever. Um, uh, and um, so I really encourage you to, to look at that just for the width of application that we had. Uh, now, S Skip admonished us early on, don't just make it look pretty, pretty, make sure that this actually works, that it adds to something. So uh, with funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we, we actually set this up in various ways to study. We're qualitative researchers, so it's a qualitative study. But we ran two workshops where we uh, funded people to annotate their articles. The first workshop, they annotated recently published articles, and that was uh, the examples that you saw. The workshop was February 2018. The second workshop was just took place late no November 2018, and those were articles that were in a working paper state at various levels. Some just written, uh, some uh, just submitted, uh, but not yet um, reviewed by the journal. Uh, and then we're following these authors along. We uh, gave, asked them to keep logbooks as they were doing that. We administered a, a survey uh, trying to gather what they found hard, what they found easy, how it made them think. We also paid graduate students then to come in and review the paper first without annotations and then with annotations uh, to see how that affected their view of the paper, their trust in the evidence, uh, et cetera. So lots of ver very rich data. Um, we haven't gone very far in analyzing that, so I'm just going to show you a snippet here. Um, so one interesting, uh, two interesting things. One is uh, people reported having spent about 20 hours uh, for this uh, per project. Those were from the first workshop, so retroactively doing this. I don't know if this is a lot or a little. It's almost three full work days to uh, be transparent. On the other hand, it's only half a week to make your uh, article transparent. So. I, always, I thought it was on the low side of effort, but uh, researchers may disagree. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, we asked people what they found hardest, and actually um, uh, the thing that people most likely were to s 
play is very hard with choosing the excerpts to use to include in annotations. So they had the excerpts. It wasn't tracking down the excerpt. It wasn't finding the source. It was none of this. It was actually, they had so much evidence that choosing uh, what they were basing their statements on was one of the hardest things, which is, I think, kind of encouraging for qualitative research um, in many ways. Some other things that we found in the first workshop, actually more than in the second workshop, uh, we found that the expectations of those graduate students before they saw the annotation, what was going to be annotated and what was actually annotated, diverged quite a bit. So that's an interesting uh, thing to study. How does it um, affect uh, research um, expectations? Uh, we saw widely uh, differing numbers of annotations from six, which we found probably too little, to 80, which was probably too many. Um, very different usage of annotations, and I'll have more, I, could talk more about that, but very exciting kind of going from the standard applications to I showed you to the linguists, to ethnographers who do kind of very interesting, more reflexive use of the annotations. Big concern, as we always have with data sharing, what are the incentives? Uh, is this going to help my uh, career commensurate with the amount of work? Uh, and an interest in uh, kind of a typology of annotations, right? What sorts of annotations do what sort of work? Uh, and just to, to finish up, this is my last slide. Uh, we just finished the second phase of the pilots. We're now uh, uh, doing the data coding and, and data analysis. Um, for the second one, we actually ran, uh, somewhat modeled actually on the ANAS challenge, uh, an ATI challenge where we asked people to submit proposals uh, for inclusion into the second workshop. We got 80 submissions, very encouraging. So people who were interested in doing that selected 19 incredibly strong proposals. The workshop was fantastic. And now one of the other challenges is logistical because we now have to follow how this will work through the peer review process. We are working with publishers, but it's an interesting uh, technological and sociological challenge. And I'd love to talk more about this. Uh, I stayed within my 10 minutes and won't, won't keep you from lunch, but I can talk much longer, so please be in touch. Thank you very, very much, uh, Sebastian, for uh, these insights into what we feel is really an exciting development uh, in, in qualitative uh, social research methodology. Uh, um, we actually do have time for one or two questions uh, on annotation for transparent inquiry. Uh, <laughs> I know it's not on the schedule, but, but it, we actually do. Uh, so if there's uh, any question on, uh, that came up, please ask. Please introduce you. To my Christian Odom Institute at the University of North Carolina. Um, you talked about the amount of time it took for folks to go back and annotate their their materials, but um, what would this look like if people were to do these annotations as they're writing their their papers? Is that something that ATI can do? And what would that would that decrease the amount? I imagine it would decrease the amount of time. We think it would decrease the amount of time, and uh, just by virtue of better data management, right? Uh, you uh, know that you're going to share your sources. You know that you're going to have to provide the source excerpts uh, and the notes as you go along. On a technical level, we're still experimenting what our approach for the workshops was, and our current approaches don't introduce new tools into researchers' workflows, so we just ask them to annotate them in whatever software they use, so write word comments, write LaTeX comments, write markdown comments. Uh, if you really want to do it in a PDF, annotate the PDF. We'll take whatever they give us and convert it into the open web annotation technology. Uh, that we use, and I think that's uh, probably the most promising approach. I really don't want to have another tool that we need to maintain and that researchers need to use, so, so work with what's familiar. And people who were doing this more during their writing stage, so second workshop did report uh, that it went more smoothly and was less frustrating than the ones that went back and did their just published articles that they thought they were done with. So, so there is some positive sign that that actually works in the way that we're hoping. Good. Any second question? Felix Schoenbrot. Thanks. A very quick one. So I wonder about the open access status um, of the annotations. So even if the paper is paywalled, so the annotations are open access? Or what, how do you do it? Um, well, yes, is the short answer. The annotations are uh, freely available. And 
the annotations are actually open access in the strict sense of the word, yes. Great, that was easy. <laughs> Any very, very last question? No? If not, uh, I would uh, all release us uh, to the lunch buffet, which I hope uh, will be ready for us outside. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you very much again for the presentation.